A special thanks to all the sponsors of the Myth Information Conference 3 in October. Author of the new book, Mythos Christos, Edwin Herbert, Atheist Republic, Godless Engineer, Kenosha Racine Area Freethinkers, Atheist Community of Milwaukee, Freedom from Religion Foundation, the Atheist Alliance of America, the Sophia Wolf Quadrachi Memorial Fund for Stem Cell Research. And please remember that your purchase of a $300 sponsorship table for the event includes one ticket to the conference and one ticket to the VIP party and also gets you mentions on all of our social media platforms as well as this podcast. And a very special shout out and thank you to all of our patrons who support the show. Welcome back live. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Mythicist Milwaukee Show, keeping the all-seeing eye of Horus on the secular movement. I'm your host, Rob Moore, the Deacon of Doubt. With me, as always, to my left, the brains of the outfit, <laughs> the friar of free thought himself, Brian Edwards. What's going on today, Brian? Yeah, I'm excited to talk to Ken Fader, a guy who is not afraid to get its hands dirty. Yeah. Sure. There you go. Right. But as, as an archaeologist, kind of that's part of the uh, <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the things we end up having to do. Right. You, you guys have to wash your hands before you go into the restroom, I think, just to uh, <laughs> just to be absolutely safe. Right. Right? Get one exactly. of those things to you know underneath the fingernails, so when you go to the gala event, you know you don't have mud. But under you know that. the the problem with that, of course, is there may be some important and significant data. Under those fingernails, <laughs> and I don't want to wash it down the sink. I want to recover all of that. An stuff. actual fossil, you know, a yeah, microscopic. You, you hey, listen, you don't know pollen and phytoliths and uh, blood residue. So I, I'd that, rather not be. I, I'd much rather have people not wash things. Now you're just That's, trying to turn us on. It's now, a perfect on. excuse, though. If if, if yeah, you have hey, listen, perfect excuse. <laughs> in, in a number of cases, archaeologists have actually found food remains in ancient teeth, between ancient teeth, and been able to reconstruct diets on the basis of that. So I always, I tell people, whatever you do, do not floss. <laughs> and have a healthy you're, snack. In you're the field. destroying evidence for future archaeologists. <laughs> He's Dr. Ken Fader. He's a professor of archaeology at Central yeah, Connecticut State University, the author of several books, and clearly a man who has no problem speaking. <laughs> Books on archaeology, including including frauds, myths, and mysteries, science and pseudoscience in archaeology, and the past yes. in perspective, an introduction to human prehistory. You may have seen him on many to documentary television series dealing with archaeology and pseudo-archaeology, such as Is It Real? Histories, Mysteries, or the BBC series Horizon. He is also co-host of the, who wrote this? The Wonderful Podcast. <laughs> who wrote this? Fanboy wrote this. I did not Archaeology this. Fantasies. This. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Oh, uh, yeah, you betcha. Uh, and I want, the audience should know that any of my books are, are suitable for birthday presents, Christmas presents, say, buy multiple copies. People love them. <laughs> yeah, right. We get that right out of the way. On Am go. Amazon, You can even take else? them in the bathroom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> You can wash your hands first, though. We don't I don't mark know. Up those Absolutely. We've made yeah, a case absolutely. for not washing them. Uh, I'm excited to have an archaeology guy on. We, so we are so heavy in researchers and, and uh, you know, uh, doctors of uh, philosophy and people who, uh, you know, are well trained in their field, but uh, less tangible, you know. And I've always been a guy who loves science, but as soon as it gets theoretical and, and sort of non tangible, I, I kind of fade away and lose interest. Here's a guy who digs up bones sure. and, and, and actual artifacts and tablets and. You know, real evidence, you know, the kind of things that you, when a creationist says to yeah. you, you know, the earth is this old, you, you know, the old Lewis Black thing, you reach in your pocket, fossil, you know, <laughs> I, I win. We have fossils. So uh, tell us uh, what, what what is it about uh, uh, archaeology that that you love and uh, how did you come to do what you do? That See, that well, there are, those are several questions. Indeed. And I'll answer all of them kind of in a, in a mishmash. Um, listen, for archaeologists, physical evidence that's the gold standard for doing science. So archaeologists are not people who tend to sit around and pontificate about things without first going out into the field and finding actual physical evidence that relates to whatever it is that they're studying. That's the gold standard. Now, I mean, I actually tell this to my students, and it's absolutely true. Um, you know, lots of – I've had kids, I have a couple of sons of my own who have gone through the process of high school and college, and kids who are in my classes, they all, they all come to a point in their lives when they agonize about, you know, what are they going to do in their future? What are they going to do when they grow up? And I cannot relate to that because I knew no lie when I was like four years old. I always wanted to dig in the dirt and find old stuff. Now, I'll grant you that for about a year when I was four, uh, the thing I wanted to do when I grew up was to be actually be a Tyrannosaurus Rex when I grew up. <laughs> and 
And then I found the horrible truth that even in America, where anybody can be president, apparently, um, or at least run for the office, you still can't become the member of an extinct species when you grow up. So I was kind of devastated when my older and much wiser friend, Frankie, who was like six, told me that I couldn't become a dinosaur. And uh, I was pretty distraught at that news, uh, started hitting the yoo real hard. And then one day, <laughs> somebody came up to me and said, well, if you're really interested in that stuff, why don't you could grow up to be the kind of scientist who studies old stuff, like paleontologist or an archaeologist. And I had no idea that such a thing existed. And that changed my life. And growing up in New York, um, I, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and lived not that many miles away from Manhattan. And my parents took me fairly frequently to the American Museum of Natural History. And that just absolutely floored me as a kid, as it does countless kids. And it was a real trip for me when I brought both of my sons, um, when they were kids, to stand in front of the T-Rex that I had stood under when I was four years old. And that so turned me on to the study of the past. Um, and I, so I spent a lot of my youth, my callow youth, wandering the halls of the American Museum and becoming more and more interested in doing archaeology and, and interest in uh, the human past, not so much dinosaurs. I gave up the dinosaur thing, the human past. Um, and it's just that immediacy. And I, and again, it's something that I feel every time I'm out in the field, when we're, we're, we're down in the dirt and scraping away soil, and you pick up something and you recognize the last human being to touch that died a thousand years ago or 4,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago. And you are the first person to re-encounter that thing. Um, it, there's that immediacy of, of connection that you make with somebody probably a lot like me who just happened to be alive centuries or even millennia ago. And it's something it's, it's, it's ineffable. I can't really explain that, but just about everybody who comes out with me into the field, everybody who does archaeology, that, that first discovery, as minor as it may be, a little chip of stone or a broken potsherd, and they just, that recognition that this has been hidden in the earth for thousands of years, and now, barring any, any invention of, say, a time machine where we can actually go back and see people behaving in the past, this is as good as it gets this connection through things, through material culture. And that's, I, I tell you, that no matter how many degrees you have as an archaeologist, as an anthropologist, no matter how many years you're out in the field, it all comes back to that moment when you uncover something in the soil and you realize, I am making a connection to somebody who was here a very long time ago. That's absolutely, that's, I think, unique and absolutely um one of the real draws for me of doing archaeology, making that connection. It's a singular human experience, what you're describing. It really I mean, is. Yeah, it's really, it's, 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 an, it's quite incredible. And, you know, you can't wipe the smile off of my face. When I say, oh, I'll give you an example. Um, this past summer, we have been excavating at a 3,000-year-old stone quarry here in northwestern Connecticut. Uh, before the Indians in this part of the world developed ceramic technology, before they made pots out of clay, before it really moved in from New York, they had limited um, uh, limited options for cooking, uh, heating up liquids or heating up stews. Uh, baskets are not waterproof and they're not fireproof. And uh, uh, bark containers, similarly, what you got to do is you got to heat up rocks in a fire, bring them over to the liquid, drop them in, and very slowly and very inefficiently you heat up the liquid. And and, and when the liquid's really cold and the rocks are really hot, the rocks can shatter and you get the grit in there. So it's kind of a mess. Um, so until, until ceramics came in, you were kind of stuck. However, in certain parts of um, New England, east of the Appalachian chain, there, it, there is and was this rock called steatite. Steatite's uh, super soft. It's a mineral. It's effectively, it's like take baby powder and glue it all together. It's solid baby powder. It's real slick, slick feeling, at, very soft, and has great heat retention. My wood stove, which is not 3,000 years old, is, has a, a cast iron framework, but the top and the sides are all made from highly polished soapstone or steatite. Same thing because of its heat retentive qualities. So in this place where we've been digging, this 3,000-year-old site, 
people were quarrying this soapstone. And again, it's like oil. It's only available in certain places. So they, these guys had a monopoly on this stuff. They were quarrying it, trading it all throughout Connecticut, southern New England, even into New York State, New York, uh, Long Island, which is south of us, has no soapstone quarries. There's no natural soapstone. And yet you look at sites along the north shore of Long Island from 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, and there's a ton of soapstone bowls. Um, so obviously that stuff is being traded. And while we were digging at the very end of this past summer's field school in um, June, beginning of July, we actually – this is a quarry. So they're not making the bowls right there. They're making the bowls for, uh, further up the, the, um, the slope in this, in this rock shelter. Um, we actually – one of my students, using a brush, using all the stereotypical tools of an archaeologist, sl- noticed that there was a little curved piece of rock just barely peeking up out of the soil. And she called me over and she said, what what could this be? And I said, listen, I don't know. Let's very slowly, very carefully remove the soil from around it. By the time she was done, she had found half of an of, of a, a carved bowl made of the soapstone. And there even was a lug or a handle on one side of that. And I can't tell you, I mean, every student who was part of that field school all kind of gathered around to see this this unveiling of this object that has sat in the ground for about 3,000 years. Just totally mind-blowing. But- um, and that, that's right there in the midst of this quarry where this large chunk of soapstone, a, a large boulder, shows evidence of other bowls having been removed from that source. Very, very cool. No, it really is. And I, I watched some of that on YouTube. So if folks are interested, check that out. It's easily Googleable. And what, what you don't say is that this was in the rain and everybody's yes. fired up. They're putting on garbage bags and ponchos and you can hear the rain in the background and nobody uh, is losing enthusiasm. But I'm oh, guessing yeah, exactly. you didn't find the golden plates that were, you know, somewhere, you know, in that vicinity of Connecticut, New York. Right. No, well, yeah, we, we haven't yet found those golden plates. But uh, but we're looking for those and we're looking for, you know, lasers and stuff like that uh, to see why the ancient aliens actually were – why they were quarrying this soapstone. <laughs> you know, I think because it's, it's fireproof, it probably worked well in their, their propulsion engines in their spacecraft. A good that re- could be. Good reentry tiles perhaps. Hey, listen. Listen. You know what's hilarious about that is that there's a site in Ohio which is a beautiful effigy mound. And it's probably 1,000 to 2,000 years old. It's the native people – built this it's 1350 feet long it's maybe six or seven feet high it's effectively it's an earth sculpture um made to look like a giant snake and it's a Mm -hmm. state park and you can walk up there's like a fire tower you can walk up and see this and the native people made this as part of the mound builder culture years ago i didn't see the um um the ancient aliens episode but apparently uh in one of the episodes of ancient aliens the claim is made that the aliens landed in that spot because they were they were um, looking for some important radioactive mineral that they could use in their spacecraft to fuel their spacecraft, and somehow this giant effigy of a snake had something to do with it. Like they built this so that when they were flying over in their spacecraft, because they don't have like really good navigational beacons, they they would look for. You know, at the window of the flying saucer, and when they see the snake, they go, "Okay, that's where we have to go." <laughs> it's it kind of is remarkable, but I mean, that's the the quality of this stuff. So, t- tell us more about that. Is this part of what you call pseudo archaeology? I'd never even heard that term. And how how do you relate your interest in the in debunking the alien theories? Uh, here's to- here's the deal. There's a there actually is a kind of a back and forth among archaeologists about what to call uh, this 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 kind of non-traditional, non-orthodox archaeology. So some people call it pseudo-archaeology. Some people call it pseudo-scientific archaeology. Some call it alternative archaeology. Mm. Some call it fringe archaeology. Now, I don't know if if you're going to have to censor this, but this was Glenn Daniel, who was a very well-known prehistorian in England, who wrote a paper in which he called it bullshit archaeology. (laughs) Which I personally, I think, is the most descriptive term. Um, I, I wrote a book a while, a few years ago called Dubious Archaeology, which is an encyclopedia of strange claims made in archaeology. And I suggested to the, um, the publisher that we call it bullshit archaeology. And apparently they decided that dubious archaeology would look better in like a school library. How about anarchaeology? 
Yeah, there you go, that too. But um, basically what we're talking about here is that, look, archaeology has really only been a professionalized science um, or in the last 100 or 120 years. So for a very long time, just about anybody, and really it's true today, anybody can say, I'm an archaeologist, I do archaeology. Um, about a year ago, I was giving a lecture about this pseudo-archaeology. I'll get back to defining it. And a gentleman approached me after I was done talking about frauds and mysteries in archaeology, and he had a, a photographs, this huge photo albums of what he thought um, were inexplicable archaeological sites. Now, when I looked at the, at the photographs, they very clearly were large glacial erratics. These are just boulders pushed around by the glacier. It's entirely natural. We know what those things are. If that was my best guess based on these photographs. And the interesting thing was he asked, well, what do you think these are? And I said, well, I think, I believe from the photographs that they're erratics. And he answered me in this very interesting way. He said, well, this is him talking. I'm not a geologist, but I don't, but they're not erratics. And I wondered about that. Um, you know, for my money, it, when you say, well, I don't have any expertise in the most relevant field, the smart thing to do at that point is to kind of, is to shut up. I mean, <laughs> you know, you know in, in other words, in other words, if, if, um, somebody were to say to me, hey, hey, Kenny, um, I've been having these blinding headaches, uh, double vision. I'm dizzy all the time. What should I do? I am not going to say to him, well, I don't know anything about uh, neurology. Uh, but here's I, I think maybe what you ought to do is eat more jello. And if that guy takes my advice, well, he deserves whatever happens to him. Uh, you know, when you when you start your sentence by saying, I don't know anything about this field, it's best then not to share. But in any event, this guy I had a very nice conversation with this fellow who didn't know anything about the relevant science. And in the end, he gave me his card and his card had his name on it. And it said archaeologist. Nice. And, you know, legally, he, you can do that. There's no legal definition of archaeology. And But the funniest part was that here's a guy who obviously had gone to the trouble of designing a business card of the expense of having a bunch made so he can hand them out to people. Do you know he spelled archaeology wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean, you know, there are two different spellings of archaeology. Some people spell A-R-C-H-A-E, mm -hmm. and some folks leave out that A because they don't want to, they don't want the Greek spelling. Like orthopedics, so, yes. Yeah, but this guy spelled archaeology wrong by, like, leaving out one of the O's. So it was really, <laughs> he, so his science is archaeology. It's like, oh, my God. Um, that, that doesn't bode well for, for how much this guy knows about the field. But that's the point. The point is that anybody can put a shingle out saying, I'm an archaeologist. Anybody can have a show and advertise themselves as being an archaeologist. But the fact of the matter is, um, it's really only in the last hundred years that people have, have figured out that like every other scientific discipline, you sort of need Back, you need experience, you need expertise, you need training in order to best interpret, collect and interpret data. And there's a, but because archaeology is one of those things that has this enormous attraction, people love the past. They think it's mm -hmm. Stonehenge, Atlantis. These are really cool and interesting things. It's another thing I tell my students that first day when it's introductory archaeology and I ask them why they're there. And a lot of kids say, well, because, you know, archaeology, it sounds really cool. And I tell them, you know, when I go out and I, if I go to a party where there are people I don't know, if I go to a bar, if I go anywhere and people are talking to me and they ask me, what do you do? Then I say, I do archaeology. Their initial reaction is always the same, which is, Wow, I've always been interested in that. And then I drop the hammer on my students saying, if you are an accounting major and you go to some place and people ask what you do and you say you're an accountant, people will never say to you, <laughs> ooh, I've always been interested in that. Nobody's going to say, wow, you get to fill out tax returns. I wish I could do that. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not meaning to, to dis accountants, but that's just something that's not going to happen. So everybody has this interest, this, this, this curiosity about what happened in antiquity. And as a result, that's why there are TV shows. That's why there are books. But the problem is that most archaeologists, 
talk amongst themselves. They talk to each other. They give papers at professional conferences where nobody outside of the discipline is going to understand anything that anybody says. And they, that's the way you progress in archaeology. That's the way you progress in a university setting. You get promotions based on the number of articles you publish in professional journals, the number of papers you give to at professional meetings. And it's it's sometimes and in for and especially in the not too distant past. Um, people looked at their noses down at archaeologists who recognize our discipline exists because of popular interest. And if we're not talking to the public, people whose goals, whose, whose motives are not necessarily exploring real data, that they, they fill that vacuum. And so yeah. people like Giorgio Tsoukalos and Eric Von Doniken and Graham Hancock and Scott Walter, none of whom have any training at all in archaeology, have figured out that, well, but if people are so interested in this, we can make stuff up. Um, we can provide these these spectacular versions, these fantastical versions of what happened in the past, and people are going to embrace that because we're the only one talking. Right. And I think another person who is taking evidence from people like this is Glenn Beck, who I checked out on um, oh older God, Fox yeah. News talking about the things called the Bat Creek Stone and yes, saying, yeah. why isn't this taught as evidence? Why isn't this in the history? Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, that's actually a hilarious story that I am kind of tangentially connected to. Several, oh, really? years, ago, se se several years ago, I was invited to a conference um, in Ohio um, at, sponsored by the Johnson Humrick House Museum, which is a really cool historical museum. And it was all about kind of strange claims made in archaeology. The reason it was held in that venue is because they actually possess and have on display uh, fake artifacts from the mid-19th century called the Newark Holy Stones. Mm. The Newark Holy Stones were found, found, and you've got, I'm putting scare quotes around that for all you podcast listeners. They were discovered in a burial mound, a Native American burial mound in the mid-19th century. The first stone that was found it looks like a plumb bob, and on and it's four sided. It's made out of clay, and it's uh, you know like about four or five inches long. And on all four sides are very clearly words in Hebrew: um, "Holy of Holies, the Lord Jehovah." And when this was discovered, this was a time when, in in especially in the American Midwest, but really throughout North America, there were these big. The big questions were. Who are the American Indians and where do they come from and how do we fit them into a biblical framework? <laughs> are, they, are they, I mean, they, they actually, there actually was a suggestion that the Native Americans were the re result of a separate creation apart from Adam and Eve. Mm. So that they were God while well, he was busy making Adam and Eve and putting them in the Garden of Eden in Mesopotamia. He was doing the same thing in the Americas. And I wish I could tell you I was making this up, but I am not. <laughs> there, one of the a Spanish cleric suggested that in the Americas the stories were parallel, but in America the tree of knowledge, the fruit from the tree of knowledge, was a banana. Okay. Now the deal there, the interesting thing there is, is this Freudian? Is you know when when Eve <laughs> when Eve when Eve presents a banana to Adam, it's like here, Adam, would you like to bite this? <laughs> I'm not. I said I wasn't going to go there, but I guess I just did. But uh, most other clerics said, "Well, no, Adam and Eve—they're the first people, and everybody filters through Noah and Noah's three mm -hmm. sons and and their kids. So Native Americans have to be descendants of one of the three sons of Noah. And in fact, one of the problems they had was there were three sons, right? There's Ham, Shem, Japheth, and Seth. Right. You got it. And and most Come European clerics had it down." Japheth, who's like, he's the goody two shoes. He's the, he's the ancestor of Europeans. Shem, he's the Asians. Uh, and Ham is Africans. And people even, they even, um, justified slavery because of the curse of Ham, that Ham did something bad and God got pissed at Ham and God said, you and your descendants will be servants to the descendants of the other sons. It, it actually says something like that in the Bible. And so there were people, there were people into the 20th century in the Ku Klux Klan saying, well, yeah, that, that's why slavery is okay because folks from Africa are descendant of yep. Ham. But anyway, so you got these three sons. Well, who are the American Indians? There's no fourth son. They must be the descendants of one of those other sons. And 
one of the one of the um, assertions was that in fact that Native Americans were members of the lost tribes of Israel, so that when they, you know there are. What, 12, 13 tribes, and most of them disappear. And historically, so gee, maybe they made it across the Atlantic, and so the Indians are actually Jewish. And there, in fact, were people who, who studied Native American culture and said stuff like, well, they don't work hard, they're cowards, and they love silver. Of course, they're Jews. Oh, Making my. that, yeah, yeah, no, it's, I, I could, I've got really curly hair, and I tell my students that I could show you quotes from the 19th century that would curl your hair, and that's why that's what happened to me. It's <laughs> crazy stuff. And in any event, so the, the so that's who are the American Indians. The second thing was in the American Midwest, as white settlers came into the Midwest, they were, they were finding these large burial monuments, these large mounds, and inside of those mounds of earth, there were the burials of of Dead folks. And who were these people? Who built the mounds? And again, major players in the history of, of, of North America looked at the mounds and said, Native Americans could not have built this. They're lazy and would never work together. There actually is a quote somewhere from Benjamin, I think it was Benjamin Barton, who was a naturalist from Pennsylvania who went and saw the mounds. And he said something like, it is, it is as absurd to believe that Indians were capable of building the mounds as it would be to believe that, that Martians built the pyramids. Wow. So completely <laughs> denying it. So, but that opened the door to a whole bunch of fraudulent stuff. People were making weird objects, shoving them in mounds, then having them be discovered to say, aha. I have found who the builders of the mounds were. They were the lost tribes of Israel. And there are, there are, there are tens of these things. Um, in West Virginia, Grave Creek Mound, they were digging this mound out and found this strange tablet at the bottom of it. Of course, they didn't find it. It was planted there. Um, the, the Newark Holy Stones, another example, the Michigan relics yep. and the, um, the Bat Creek Stone in Tennessee with Hebrew writing on it. Now, here's the deal. So here, anyway, I'm at this conference, and this is what we're, we're talking about, all these kind of weird stuff. And while I'm in the hotel waiting for the conference to start, I get a phone call from a television production company saying, yeah, we're in town, we're going to come to the conference, and we're doing a video, and this is exactly how they described it to me, about the lost civilizations of America. Now, when I hear lost civilizations, my spidey senses start tingling because that usually means lost civilization. That means Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And so my response to this guy was, well, listen, if you're talking about Atlantis, what are you going to say? Oh, no, no, no. We're not talking about Atlantis. We're talking about how the great cultures of Native Americans have been ignored and denigrated historically. And we want to, ex we want to expose that and we want to embrace that. And I thought, well, the hell yeah, that's what I do. That's what my colleagues do. We, we, we show the, the true genius and creativity of Native American society, Native American culture. So in any event, so I said, sure. I'll, I, they contacted everybody else who was in that conference. And so after I was done giving my paper, they took me aside. The museum gave them a space where they interviewed me. And it was the, the questioning was kind of strange about, well, how would you know if another culture came here? Uh, and what about the Vikings? And so I gave my usual rap about this is what archaeology has shown. No evidence of ancient Hebrews, no evidence of Celts or Phoenicians or Egyptians. And it, that was cool. Um, and we all did it. And we all kind of talked about it afterwards saying it was just so odd. The questioning was sort of odd. Didn't ask, didn't, didn't ask much else. The next thing that happens is we all are, we all obtain pre uh, pre-release copies, so DVDs of, of what these guys had produced. Okay. And we watched it all, and it was one of those deals where within seconds we were all on the phone with one another saying, what in the hell did we agree to do? Because it was abundantly clear that these guys, the, the, product, the producers, and they had never told us this, were clearly – uh, Mormons. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing with the video was effectively saying that archaeologists now can prove that the literal truth of the Book of Mormon, uh, they can, they can prove the literal truth of the Book of Mormon. And that these Indians 
are, are connected to the ancient Jews and they can genetically be, be connected to, to the Middle East. And all this other stuff was exactly contrary to what we were saying. So we flipped out. We wrote like a position paper and responded to that. We then ended up writing three articles for the Skeptical Inquirer, um, the, the house organ of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, about how we had been misled about what the purpose of this was and how our words had been um, completely misrepresented. What, in, in, in the midst of all this, somebody calls me and says, uh, turn on Glenn Beck. This is when he had the regular show, I guess. Right. And I turn it on and, oh, my God, it, the, the show is devoted to what these guys were saying in this video. And he was showing stuff like the Bat Creek Stone. I don't remember if he got to the New York Holy Stones, but essentially saying, why are we not taught this truth? And again, it was because of the, it was the Mormon connection right. for sure. It so, has to be. Yeah, so we all went, of course, we went crazy, but then thought, well, you know what? We at least now can say that indirectly, anyhow, none of us were mentioned by name, that indirectly, at least, our thoughts, our ideas have been misused by Glenn Beck, and that's a point of pride for us. <laughs> right, right. You've really arrived now. Like I say, when, when the Muslims okay, want to kill man. us, we've done our job around here <laughs> at Mythicist Milwaukee. You're listening to the Mythicist Milwaukee show, and we're talking to Ken, Kenny Fader from Connecticut, uh, an enthusiastic archaeologist. Uh, I went to Beloit in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin here, and it's built around uh, the mound, so I'm well acquainted with what you're talking about. Nice anthropology department there built in part at least on the uh, ex yeah. excavations hey, of the Winnebago culture. And I'm, my yeah. question is, uh, how could anyone think that that was complicated, building a, an earth mound? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? When you, when you look especially at the, um, the, the ancient aliens guys who look at things like, uh, like mounds, but also Egyptian pyramids and the Sphinx, and they, they essentially the bottom line there is that their assumption is always that uh, human beings are really dumb and uninventive and they needed a source from the outside. What, what I again, the, the phrase that I always use is that that these guys believe that the ancient people needed an extraterrestrial peace corps. <laughs> to, you know, uh, right, arrive right. on Earth and say, oh, you dumb bastards, here's how you pile up dirt. Here's, <laughs> here's how you drop a log over a river and get across. Uh, and, you know, and, and the other thing, and this this goes for ancient aliens, it goes for the Atlantis crowd as well, is they'll look at pyramidal forms uh, in Egypt and in Mesoamerica, in South America, in North America. And they'll say, listen, all these things are so similar, they must have had a common source and some people point to the common source and, well, that's Atlantis. They taught everybody how to do this. Or they point up to the sky and they say, the frog people from Alpha Centauri, they landed and taught everybody how to <laughs> pile stuff up. And then you, you, when you ask them, well, wait a minute. If you, especially with a rather, rather simple technology, if you want to build something big, how else could you build it except big? You know, I feel like this is like an old Monty Python bit. It's really big on the bottom and it gets small on the top. Because if you did it the opposite way, it would fall over. <laughs> right, or straight like a skyscraper. They, they wouldn't yeah. have the technology it, yet. It, so. it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so the bottom line here is with the mounds. The mounds are tremendous works in terms of the amount of labor that it would have involved. When, you know, you, you have to look at it from this, this perspective, this context, that most people think of Native Americans as being teepee living, yeah. horseback riding nomads who – don't have a lot of technology, who don't do a lot of communal labor and just kind of wander around. If you look at, for example, Monk's Mound, Monk's Mound in um, Illinois, uh, in the site of Cahokia, which was the center of a Native American city. Yep, that's the word mm -hmm, city mm -hmm. does apply there. There are 10,000 people living in the city itself and maybe another 20,000 people in the suburbs, the farmers who supported the... Um, the economy and social and political system of which Cahokia was the capital. Monk's Mound is 100 feet high. It covers like 14 acres. There's millions of, of, of pounds of dirt in there. And, and the deal is, if you look at Monk's Mound, the volume of Monk's Mound makes it the fifth largest pyramid in the world. Wow. And that includes everything in Egypt and everything in Mesoamerica. So, but so the idea that, listen, Native Americans could, when they needed to, when they wanted to, when their social and political system justified it or, in fact, demanded it, they could make these gigantic, monumental pyramids of yeah. Earth 
on the tops of which their great rulers lived. And there's more um, recent evidence of, of Native American, quote unquote, cities, even as late as like the War of 1812. Tecumseh had gathered an enormous like congregation of 10 or 20,000 Indians in Indiana. Right. Yeah. So this is th- this notion again that, well, and I think there's uh, Robert Silverberg who wrote a book called The Myth of the Mound Builders. It's all about the mound builder myth, this idea that an alien culture came to North America, built all the mounds, and that they're even older than the Indians. The Indians arrived like 10 minutes before Columbus. Um, and, and in fact, the, the native, in, the Indians were, this is, this is, I'm exaggerating just a little. The notion was that a very sophisticated, very advanced culture, probably connected to Europe, maybe connected to the Middle East, had arrived in North America, had built these wonderful cities and these beautiful mounds, and then hordes of, of, of vandals, uh, of Northeast Asian um, uh, vandals, came across into the New World, wiped out all of these very sophisticated cultures, and that those were the people who Europeans encountered when they came here after the voyages of Columbus. And what mm. Silverberg says is, well, that myth was really comforting to them. In other words, well, if we're killing all the Indians, well, we're just giving back to them what they did to the sophisticated culture that wow. was before. And that, you know what? Those mound builders, they may have been Europeans. So we're just recovering from them what those bad guys stole from us. That, that's the phrase he uses, that it's, it was comforting to the conquerors. Um, and, and it was. I mean, if you read this stuff from the 19th century, it's very clear that there's this this uh, this very very um, obvious and explicit attempt to disassociate Native Americans from these sophisticated sites that clearly um, uh, that marked the the, uh, the landscape of ancient North America. Funny thing there though, with a really funny thing, and I think it's a language thing that if you look at the Spanish explorers in the American Southeast, De Soto and those guys which is in the 16th century, mm-hmm. they are encountering Native Americans living in these these places uh, with building mounds, with the chief being, the chief residence up on top. I think it was one of DeSoto's chroniclers who measured one of these mounds and talked about how this is how high it was, and this is how many houses they could put on top, and these are the chiefs and the noblemen. They live on tops of the houses. So we've got Spanish eyewitness accounts of these sites being made and used by yep. Indians. But then when English speaking people come into Ohio and see the same thing, they say, wow, nobody ever saw an Indian build these things. And all they had to do is read the Spanish, the, the, the memoirs of these Spanish explorers from like 300 years before, but they didn't. It's hard to believe too. I mean, the city of Tenochtitlan's built as a man-made island in, in the middle of Lake Texcoco with four causeways. I mean, this is, these are the Aztecs. So how, if they yeah. can do that, why can't? The mound builders build mounds. This is well, but really, you know, it's funny about that is that for whatever reason, I think that 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 Europeans in North America, in what became the United States, were okay. They were kind of some of them anyway. Were comfortable with the Aztecs and the Toltecs and the Maya being like really sophisticated, but that's south of the border. <laughs> okay. Because even in some cases, and listen, we talk about Wisconsin, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's a an amazing mound site in Wisconsin, the place called Aztlan. And Aztlan, which is now a state park and the mounds are there for you to see, looks so much like a small version of Cahokia that some archaeologists suggest it was a colonial outpost. Wow. That, that in, this, in the northern Midwest, there are resources that they don't have down in Missouri and Illinois, especially in Michigan, um, copper. But there are other resources not available in the South, and that the idea here is that the Cahokians may have sent up a group who built their own little outpost there and were able to funnel stuff down the Mississippi. You're 300 and some miles away from Cahokia. But the reason the site is named Astalan is because Europeans who encountered it said, well, that sounds like an Aztec. Let's make up an Aztec word because it must have been the Aztecs who were up here. <laughs> in, in Arkansas, there's a mound site, again, made by Native Americans, part of the builder culture. They called it Toltec Mounds. It still is called Toltec Mounds because they said, they looked at it and said, it must have been the Toltecs from Mexico who made this because our Indians certainly couldn't have made it. <laughs> So, wow. so wow. That, that that so that happened a bunch where again there was for what for, for whatever reason people were able to disassociate Indians north of the border those are the savages those are the the vandals those are the Mongol hordes and that the folks south of the border well that's something different 
So I'm dying to know what the actual source of the Jewish plumb bob was. Oh, so, so all right. Here's back to that. that it, nobody knows for sure. But there's Brad Lepper and Jeff Gill. Brad's an archaeologist in Ohio, and Jeff Gill, in fact, is a is a minister. I think he's Episcopalian minister. Real bright guy. And the two of them have been studying the uh, the New York Holy Stones for years. Oh, but, but, but let me let me step back just a little bit. You know, after the plumb bob was found, this the guy who found it brought it to a local uh, minister who actually was fluent in Hebrew. And he looked at it and said, oh, yeah, this is really good Hebrew, but there's a problem. We know the mounds are very ancient. The the version of Hebrew that's on this is quite modern. Yeah. It's like 20th It's like, like 19th century That's something to do with the Masons. There was there were some Masonic references. Yes, yeah. So, so but the, the, the deal here is, and this is, this happens in archaeology more than you can imagine. Um, so he gave it back to this guy and said, no, somebody, somebody's pulling a scam on you. This is fake. This is not real. And the guy went back and like six weeks later, a couple of miles away, um, he found another artifact with Hebrew, but this time it was the right kind of Hebrew. <laughs> in other words, it was authentic to the period when they thought the mounds were being built. And in that case, it was the, it was a, an attenuated version of the Ten Commandments and, a, and a, an image of what was supposed to be Moses on it. So a better a fake. Buddy, hey, well, listen, <laughs> I have a friend of mine, Nick Bellantoni, who was the state archaeologist of Connecticut, who was punked by people um, <laughs> doing they, an, an entire archaeological site was faked by a guy who turns out to be we think he's like a performance artist who made a bunch of this stuff. It's very clearly made with modern equipment, modern tools. Nick knew that immediately. And Nick held, this got a lot of local press, so Nick held a press conference to reveal what his analysis showed. And Nick said, you know, Kenny, I'm kind of afraid to do it because if I tell people, we just figured out how you fake this archaeological site, the next, they'll learn from that. <laughs> It'll be like a primer and what mistakes not to make. And they'll go back and next time, it will be harder. So right. what happens in the case of the New Holy Stones is clearly this somebody faked it. It didn't pass muster. So they went back to the drawing board. They made a better, smarter version of it. So now they, they've answered the primary objection to this thing being legit. What Brad and Jeff suggest is that this was all, this is a really interesting time in North America when Native Americans were actually, again, this notion that maybe they're not part of the Adamite creation. Maybe they're not even human beings. Maybe they're completely separate. And people took from that the notion that, well, then it's okay to kill them or it's okay to enslave them because they're not really people like we are. And there was a controversy among churchmen, among historians about, well, how should we perceive Native Americans, especially in a biblical framework? And so the notion is perhaps, this is Brad and Jeff suggests, that these artifacts were fake, but with a good intention. And the good intention was, if we show that Native Americans are somehow connected to the Bible, because there, there's Hebrew writing in these mounds, that people will, will perceive Native Americans to be part of the human race. Right. We can save them again. And, yeah, so, so, but nobody actually knows. All we know is that they're really interesting fakes, and they're, they're part of a, uh, of a set of these things found all over the United States. Um, uh, uh, I'm actually, right now, I'm in the very tail end of a sabbatical, where I've traveled all over the country looking at these fake archaeological sites and artifacts, and how, who would have thunk this? In a little town called Los Lunas, which is in New Mexico, it's, I don't know, 45 minutes an hour outside of Albuquerque. There's, a, at the city dump for Los Lunas, <laughs> you, you hike about a mile and a half in the middle of this kind of volcanic scarred landscape. And there is a large stone. It's several feet across, several feet high, hidden in this little niche. And it's got Hebrew writing all over it. Hmm. And it's, it's the Ten Commandments all over <laughs> again. And the deal here is that the actual historically, there's no record of this thing existing until the 1930s. Although the person who it, who um, exposed its existence in the 1930s said, "Well, the guy who took me here said that he was an old guy, and he said he remembered seeing it when he was a kid in the 1860s or 1880s." 
Um, but really and for true, it's the 1930s. But if you go online and read uh, people's talking about the Los Lunas Decalogue stone, the Los Lunas Ten Commandments, you'll see lots of people who say, oh, this fits, this yeah. fits Mormon ideology perfectly. These were ancient Jews who came to the New World and they, they went to New Mexico. And, and Coronado just, missed it completely. Somehow. Uh, well, apparently so. Apparently so. It's yeah. the Mythicist Milwaukee Show. It's time for a little feature we like to call Myth of the Day. Antonio's been waiting patiently to regale us with yet another version of Myth of the Day. Day, day. Take it away, Antonio. As always, thank you again, Dr. Fader, for being on the show today. Sure. I'd like to say thank you to some of the individuals that have retweeted or liked your presence on today's show. Lego Darwin, James Kirk Wall, The Positive Atheist, also Kristen Hood at Kristen Hood 1, Uncouth Ace the Atheist, Broken Records, Godless Engineer, Melissa Pugh, President of Atheist Alliance of America, and Miguel Connor of Aeon Byte Radio. So keeping in line with archaeology, in July of 2003, archaeologists working along the Vafiris River riverbed in Dion, Greece, uncovered the remains of the first temple known to be dedicated to the supreme Zeus. Among the artifacts found was a 2,400-year-old headless marble statue along with 14 columns depicting eagles. Eagles are one of the divine symbols of the chief deity Zeus in ancient Greece. The discovery is significant because it offers us an idea of how Zeus was represented during an important transition period in ancient Greek worship. The statue is likely a missing link between ancient Greece's worship of many gods and the single god philosophy of the Abrahamic religions. The Greeks were embracing the idea of monotheism on their own before the arrival of Christianity. Quote, we know how the ancients depicted this Hypsistus Zeus. It is the first time we see it, said archaeologist Demetrius Pantermalis, who has led digs for over 35 years at Dion near Mount Olympus. Quote, experts believe the Hypsistus, or Supreme Zeus, emerged as a more dominant figure as Greeks moved away from many gods and cults that included dozens of variations of Zeus, Lawrence of Journal, Wor Lawrence Journal World. The Greeks sometimes identified that highest god with Zeus. After all, the word Zeus in its native form, Theos, is where we get our word Dios. So there is an etymological reason to understand Zeus as the highest deity, Professor Dennis McDonald, John Wesley, and Claremont School of Theology, and that is our myth of the day. Oh, wow. Like a religious tetrapod. Cool. That's cool. I didn't Transitional know that. form. I didn't know that. You're, uh, we've been talking to uh, Kenny Fader, and he's an archaeologist, uh, concentrating in, uh, in Connecticut, and he's still on active digs, it sounds like, in Connecticut. We wonder, uh, we've been so archaeology heavy, which is great, because we don't usually get into that kind of stuff, but we need to relate it to secularism a little bit. And we've heard how archaeology has been used to serve religion, whether you know correctly or unfairly. Uh, how is it serving uh, secularism in the uh, 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 the atheist movement. Well, you know, I, I think that so much of of what what you see, especially on cable, but that permeates the the internets, is this notion that the archaeological record shows some really weird stuff that can be explained only by reference to powerful powerful forces that are not of this world. Now. Um, a friend of mine, Jason Calavito, who's a great blogger on all of this stuff, distinguishes the kind of the nuts and bolts ancient aliens hypothesis, which is, listen, there, there, there are people out there, there are creatures, there are entities out there in outer space. They make physical aircraft, physical spacecraft. They trans, they they transverse the universe. They land on Earth in the past, and they had an impact on people. But those are, those are nuts and bolts crap. What we are now beginning to see, and have for some time now, as Jason points out, is this, this transformation of a nuts and bolts kind of physical entity, space guys, ancient astronauts, who now are proposed to be spirit paranormal entities Maybe they're the Nephilim from the Bible. <laughs> Maybe they're demons. And no, I'm serious that there's 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 a, a major push now on the part of some people um, to interpret what 
again, previously had been, well, it's like Star Trek. And, you know, Star mm-hmm. Trek, that was real. That was a documentary. So maybe they're landing on Earth and it's the prime directive, so they're not allowed to tell us about it. <laughs> but they have an impact on us. But now know that these are not physical entities. They are entities that maybe have been mentioned in the Bible. And they are, literally, the, the film gets thrown around a lot. That's kind of the go-to explanation now. That those lights in the sky and the and the changes in ancient societies and ancient cultures are the result of this interaction between plain old human beings and these spirit entities. Um, not that long ago, and I think the show has 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 gone off the air. There was a show on the History Channel, or the, the we make a whole bunch of stuff crap up and put it on TV like it's real channel mm-hmm. that doesn't go go as well on there, you know, as an icon or as it as doesn't a, roll off the tongue. Exactly. But there was a show about finding giants, the notion that, that archaeologists, especially at the Smithsonian, have known for years that these kind of, that these paranormal entities have left behind these bones and that they're giants 10, 15 feet tall and we're hiding all this, but this has something to do with demonic um, interaction with, with human beings, with, with um, paranormal entities that are all mentioned in the Bible. And so, you know, as an archaeologist, I, it certainly is my obligation to say, you know, guys, I have dug more holes in the ground mm-hmm. than all of these theorizers as, have ever dug. And i got to tell you something. We don't find giants. We don't find evidence of, of biblical or spiritual entities having impacted the ancient Native Americans of Connecticut or of anywhere else for that matter. But but you so, do find mass mass deaths, I imagine, right? Where the Europeans come over, introduce diseases, and you have mass deaths. Why wouldn't an alien who dropped in here? I, the first thing I think of is some virus just wipes everyone out. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, go on. I mean, then see, yeah, yeah. The, of course, and you do know that that there is some direct evidence of Europeans who recognize that that if you traded blankets that had been uh, used for smallpox victims. If you traded those to Indians, the Indians would all die. And so it's a, one of the early examples of germ or biological warfare. And that the, um, the, the Puritans who came to New England actually interpreted the massive die-off of Native Americans as that was God doing that wow. to clear New Canaan for us. Wow. They, they, and they, they use, I mean, these guys are not talking metaphor when they say, we are the new Israelites, the Indians are the Canaanites, we have returned to the promised land after our, our sojourn in Egypt, and now God, we don't have to kill the Indians off because God is doing that for us. Um, the deal with the, the whole ancient aliens thing is just, it's, it's so on the fringes of anything that is, that, that any data, um, supports. But yeah, for sure, if, if, there are a whole bunch of if-thens. If ancient aliens landed on Earth in antiquity, there's a list of things that we would absolutely necessarily see in the archaeological record. And we don't see any of that. We don't see massive die-offs. We don't see, you know, no spacecraft 2,000 years ago crashed and left behind little bits and pieces or little parts. There's no evidence of these enormous jumps in technology um, the, the <laughs> building of the pyramids, agriculture, metallurgy, we see very nice evolutionary developmental steps marked by trial and error, not the kind of thing ancient aliens would do. But, but in more to the point, you'll see the ancient aliens crowd who point to the ground drawings, the geoglyphs in uh, on the Nazca Plain of South America. Mm-hmm. These spectacular, gigantic images of things like, like uh, spiders and hummingbirds and monkeys – and you got folks saying, oh, these can't be seen from the ground. They must have been directed from above. Aha, aliens. And of course, the question to ask there is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So Captain Kirk and Spock and McCoy land on Earth in antiquity. And what's, what is it that they do? They direct the natives to build them a giant <laughs> monkey in the desert? What the? That doesn't make any sense. Um <laughs> But, you know, what are you going to do? And then and, and then, in the modern ancient aliens interpretation is that not only did they help people along materially, they actually helped us along genetically. So commonly you will now hear among the ancient aliens guys that, that well, the aliens landed on Earth and they used, ar- they, they used artificial mutations and genetic engineering to create us from apes. Which is, which is, you know, wow. bizarre and interesting. But the, actually that 
that claim starts with Von Donneken, or it's like a trace back to Von Donneken, in an interview he did in the 1970s, and he's not talking about genetic recombination or engineering. He actually flat out says aliens landed on Earth and had sex with women mm. and produced the next stage of human evolution, which is amazing. Um, Carl Sagan, back in the day, responding to that claim, said that that you know it's more likely biologically that a human being could successfully mate with a petunia I love because that. at least the human and the petunia evolved on the same planet. So the, the right. idea that the aliens landing on Earth would have the same matching physical equipment, much less the correct DNA, the number of chromosomes to mate with our ancestors and produce offspring is just, well, it's crazy and well, it's absurd. sex always sells, though, and I suppose this is no different. It makes the tale all the more lurid and uh, well, easier you, for folks to grab onto. Well, if you're a fan of Star Trek, you know that Kirk, he was kind of a dog. He liked that. And, yeah. You know, but yeah, if this would it. it would it would influence me a lot more if the Nazca people would have made a tribble. Okay, there you go. That, <laughs> there you go. I got gotcha. you. Absolutely, a tribble <laughs> that would be more convincing than a monkey, a spider, and a giant hummingbird. Indeed. That's for sure. Talk to us about uh, about uh, archaeology in the old world. We're primarily concerned with the Jesus myth theory here and mythicism in general. Do you have any thoughts on, say, the work of a Rene Psalm who? Uh, uh, has decided that the uh, archaeology surrounding the city of Nazareth dates it to a time when Jesus couldn't possibly have lived there because it didn't exist yet. You got any thoughts yeah. on that? Uh, not specifically, because I'm not that familiar with it, but generally speaking, here's here's what happens. You get um, a, a cohort of folks who want very desperately for... I mean, it's, almost, it's almost a meme, I guess, or is it a trope, where you'll see an article in the paper archaeologists prove something in the Bible. And, you know, in the back 50 years ago, it was, okay, there actually are cities mentioned in the Bible that archaeologists have been able to excavate and to date to around about the time when the Bible was written or sometime before. But then you've got this, this, and that's fine, but then you have this, this again, this meme of anytime there's any evidence of a flood, anytime there's any evidence of a whole bunch of animals dying all at once, anytime there's evidence of, of something related to the time of Christ, like the, 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 the ossuary, you know, the tomb in which it says this is, you know, this is Jesus or, or mm -hmm. whatever, that there's this, this, this rush to embrace that, um, and usually without sufficient um, time to think about, well, what exactly does the evidence show? Um, I mean, the bottom line here is that we're looking at the old world. You know, guess what? There's no evidence of a Garden of Eden. There's no evidence of the flood of Noah. There's no evidence of Noah's Ark. There's no evidence of the biblical story of Exodus. There's no evidence that Jews were building pyramids as slaves unto Pharaoh, that there's no physical evidence for any of that. And then when you start looking at time periods, you can see that the, 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 biblical, the Bible is an interesting book in which a whole bunch of things that happen in different places at different times gets cobbled together to make one coherent tale, one coherent myth. But when you start comparing it to physical evidence, archaeological evidence, and historical evidence, it doesn't mesh. It doesn't fit together. But you know, that ultimately what happens, of course, is that it's the difference between science and religion. In science, it's all bets are off. Let's see where the data take us, and let's test all of these hypotheses. And wherever that leads, that's the direction in which we are going to go. That's very different from somebody who has the truth already in their hands, and that everything that's that's discovered has to fit into that already existing truth. Right. And those are two completely different um, approaches to reality in the world. And I know that you know, Stephen Jay Gould, one of my scientific heroes, and heroes, a hero in terms of his, his ability to popularize science, mm -hmm. and he talked about oh, the non-overlapping magisteria, right? So you've got science and religion, and they don't have to be in conflict because they're, they're on parallel tracks. And I think that in a lot of ways, I look at that as kind of a cop-out. Because, well, no, I mean, if somebody says, ah, the Bible says there was a universal flood, and we're going to go look for the ark, then that's not a parallel track. That's going to intersect with the archaeological right. record. That's going to intersect with geol ge the geological record. And yes, they are going to come into conflict because as soon as you say, once, once you, once you go beyond saying, listen, I, I accept this on faith. I don't need evidence. I don't want to hear evidence. 
this is what I believe in my soul, whatever that is, that's fine. Okay, that's cool. But if you then say, oh, and by the way, we have physical evidence to support my religion, then it's outside of the, you know, that's that's not, that's my ballpark. That's the ballpark yep. of scientists. And you got to play by our rules, not yours. Um, and sometimes people get kind of angry about that, but, they're, you know, I, I, I can't help. <laughs> well said. Um, it's uh, uh, Kenny Fader, and we are out of time, I'm afraid. It's uh, almost uh, the hour. He is an author, an archaeologist. Find your stuff uh, on uh, YouTube. On uh, where, where can we uh, find your works as a parting shot? Uh, yeah, you go to, go on to Amazon, and you can find uh, most of my books are on Amazon. And uh, the, the fun thing on Amazon is to look at the reviews of the books, and you'll see, you know, folks, th there's a wide disparity in how people react to them because people who don't like um, the scientific method or people who are opposed to some of their cherished beliefs being questioned, they hate my books. And, and maybe that's a good thing. But the, right. the good news there is they, maybe they buy them just to, to be able to rip them apart. So. That's right. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us, Ken. It was uh, fantastic. Hope to talk to you again. We could have talked for an hour. Oh, yeah. Great stuff. And uh, you're, you're welcome. I absolutely loved it. Thank you so much. Good deal. Join us next week for Jason Heap. And uh, that's... Uh, yeah, he's the uh, United Coalition for Reason guy, and uh, we will see you at the regular time, 2 o'clock next Sunday. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and take it easy. Yep. Ken Fader, evidence must be questioned.